Isaac Adams. Sean DeMars. The Room for Nuance podcast. Will you open us in prayer? I would love to, brother. All right. Thank you for having me. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in this conversation, that uh, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And Lord, mm. we confess we need help for that. Yes. And we need wisdom, not the wisdom from below, but the wisdom from above that is peaceable and open to reason, full of mercy, impartial, sincere, that leads to a harvest of peace and righteousness. Father, mm. help us, we pray. Thank you for this effort. Bless this initiative. Bless this conversation. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, Isaac, can you just give people a 30-second bio of, of who you 30 are? 30-second? I thought this was room for nuance. You're right. You're, you're, okay. Here's the 30-second 30 box. 35 seconds. <laughs> uh, bio who I am. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Let's see, Isaac Adams, I've been your friend for a long time. I like that you started there. Hey, man. You know. <laughs> Many moons. I love my wife. I'm right. uh, married. Yes. Uh, let's see. I'm um, the lead pastor of Iron City Church in Birmingham, Alabama. For oh. two years now? Uh, coming on too, yeah. Nice. yeah, 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 man. Um, before that, uh, I was in uh, Capitol Hill at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, served a number of different positions there. I uh, was a pastor on staff. Um, can I can I pause you right there? Yeah. I love your story, bro. This isn't a part of my 35 seconds. No, not all at all. Right. You much. were a member. I was. Faithful. Became an intern. Faithful. Mm -hmm. Became well, a member. Member. Well, yes. I was around these. I've, yeah, yeah, you were yeah. there. And then yeah. pastoral assistant. Yes. Faithful. Yes. And then assistant pastor. Yeah. Right? And then yeah. associate? Uh, stopped at assistant. Stopped at assistant. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, uh, we, we hope that that's the story of guys in our church, right? Praise We're just God. raising up faithful dudes who are just, yeah, trying to get after it in ministry. Praise God, yeah. man. Well, I mean, they, I mean, I think they were doing... I got a text that I got, my name was mentioned at a, a members meeting. I was, you know, those texts are always fun. I'm yeah. like, ooh. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> no, it was all, it was all good. They were, I think, talking about their VBS. And I think Mark said something like, and Isaac Adams can happen this way. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so I was a kid. I had Mark, I, Mark Dever, uh, his son went to school with me. So we were childhood friends. I was never a member of the church, but then when, when I came back to do the internship, joined and gotcha. that, that's the road you yeah. laid out. So yeah, uh, but now uh, the assistant pastor, she's really like the residency program there. Right. I was sent out to uh, be the pastor here in Birmingham, Alabama, a place I never thought I'd live. We could talk about that. Uh, I'm married um, to Megan. I saw this thing the other day. I thought it was really good. This dude said, I don't call my wife my best friend. That's a demotion. Ooh. And I was like, oh. Okay. All right. Let's circle but, back around to that one. Yeah. So uh, married to Megan. We have uh, <clears throat> three little kids. Um, so I always say our kids look like little balls of peanut butter on hey. wheels. Just hey. running around. I mean, literally. Hey, and you can say that. <laughs> I, I can say <laughs> you that. You can say that. But don't say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, man. So uh, anyway, and then last thing. Um uh, founded a ministry called United We Pray, which is now yep. a part of Iron City Church, which is devoted to helping Christians pray and think about racial strife. Mm. Uh, so, Spoken word artist? I'd say retire. Retire. Same. I'd say retire, yeah. but I, uh, Sean, I heard a piece the other day, and it made me want to break it back mm. out. Like I was like, can I pull this off in time for... Uh, I don't want to time stamp our podcast, yeah, but yeah. like, can I get this done in time for Easter? And I was like, no, I no. have to get a sermon done. So, You think you still got it? <sighs> muscle memory? I'd like to think that, but Bro, you're you know, gonna, it's always, I mean, writing, it's always clear up here and then you go to write it and it's like, yeah, it ain't. It ain't and, and also author, author of yes, uh, yeah. talking about race, talking gospel, about race. Yeah. hope for hard conversations. Amen. This is going to be the bulk of our conversation today, Great. Uh, but also the author of this little booklet that I give away all the time. Mm. I recently just read a section of it to mm. our congregation in our Sunday morning service Praise to God. not only encourage, but to exhort mm. them to go get a copy and to read it. Mm. Uh, this is what if I'm discouraged in my evangelism, part of the nine marks little questions and answer series or church question series. Uh, and we're going to get to this a little bit later, but uh, a tiny book, yeah. uh, very, very, very largely helpful. Mm. Yeah, Praise God, man. Let's edit that. Tiny book, largely helpful. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or don't edit it. Who cares? <laughs> so, uh, brother, let's just get into it. Let's do it. Um, would it be would it be naive of me to ask you for a ten thousand foot overview 
of the American evangelical landscape when it comes to thinking about race? Is that is that too big of a of an ask? Probably. Because okay. well, but uh, I mean, I can certainly try, but I appreciate even the recognition that it could be that because I think yeah. a lot of people are like, well, what is it? And I'm like, well, where are we talking about? What? Who exactly. are we talking about? Yeah. Um, but I think there are, you know, we were talking about this even on United We Pray, like doing kind of like what's the state of the union yeah. here? Like yeah. what's what's going on? And I think let me. I just am so glad my answers don't have to be 30 seconds. So no, let me just say time, a few bro. things. Yeah. Uh, one right now, I would say where we're at right now, 2023, uh, American evangelicalism is people are, the the fractures have happened mm. and people have taken their ball and gone Would you home. say the fault lines? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, you can. I'm, <laughs> I'm well, but I mean, like, insofar as that's a, an accurate metaphor, yeah, it, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, I think yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, there are real fault lines. Yeah. Is real, and I was even gonna, you know, play upon that metaphor when I go back. But like, where we're at right now, I th I think it's you know, the conversation in so many ways has stopped. I don't mm -hmm. think it's kind of we could call it a detente. We could call it you know. DMZ, we could, but I don't even think it's that. Like, okay. I think it's like the forces aren't even present. It's like you do your thing over there. I'm doing my thing over there. You know, some of that I'm sure is commendable. Life is short. I'm like, I'm going to stay on the wall. I'm not going to come down. Yeah. Um, Jesus is coming soon. And, uh, you know, I love him and you'll see him in heaven. But uh, I think, you know, I think Satan's also getting a win on some mm -hmm. of that. So that's where we're at right now. Okay. 10,000 foot. But I think if we're talking kind of like what happened or we can talk really about the last, let's call it 10 to 11 years, 2012, Trayvon Martin happens, mm -hmm. uh, 2014, Michael Brown happens, 2020, George Floyd. And, it, it, and, and sadly, and I'm pointing to those three instances because sadly, I think there's a genre of killings like that. Um, be it Amar Arbery, Walter Scott, we could go through so many, Philando Castile. I'm not saying they're all the same. I'm not saying, you know, sure. they're all unique cases, but let's just talk about what our churches were feeling. I, I mean, the, the sort of icons of our discontent, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, in the language, I in tragedies nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't, yeah. I don't care where you stand. These are the things issue. that like, we're all bickering about, yes, talking about. Yes, yeah. lamenting, grieving, right. questioning. Yeah. And so those three events, tragedies, let's call them. Uh, and in some case, I mean, you know, even the Walter Scott thing, like it's just clear, it's been ruled injustice. This was mur uh, Walter Scott or uh, I was even thinking of Maude Arbery. It's so sad that I get the names confused because there's so many. Mm. But anyway, those three, Trayvon, Michael Brown, George Floyd, really represent, I think, three kind of epicenters. And the tremors of those, so this is the kind of earthquake fault line yeah, yeah. metaphor. The tremors of those were felt throughout evangelicalism, I think in different ways where Trayvon was. Now, again, this is a very limited perspective, 100,000 foot view 10, 000, on 10 yeah, years. Yeah. We're not talking about 1865. We're not talking about Frederick Douglass. We're not talking about Francis Grimke, but we could, right? So limited, limited yeah. view. But just for this specific question, with those three epicenters, tremors were felt, and Trayvon was like, whoa, what's going on, right? Michael Brown's like, we need to talk about this. And George Floyd's like, we have to talk about this. Or at least you have to pick your side, I have to pick my side. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of that, you have uh, President Trump and all of the things represented in there. So you, you've seen the kind of clamoring and then the biting and devouring that James speaks of. I think mm -hmm. some of that is because we're made in the image of God and we care about justice. Mm -hmm. We serve a God of justice. Justice and righteousness are the foundation of his throne, as the Psalms say. And so uh, we care about those things and it's right to. And so we are animated by them. Um, and yet we have a real adversary that hates the church of God, that knows Jesus said, this is how the world will know you're my disciples, by the way you love one another. And if y'all are one, the world will understand that the Father really did send the Son, so Satan has a vested interest in us not being one and in us hating each other. Okay. And so anyway, man, so all that to say, I think that's, you. we went from a phase of kind of 
It seemed like it. I mean, Sean, it seemed like it was all good. 11 years ago. It really did. We were at the same conferences. We were on Legacy the Legacy in Chicago. Oh, yeah, like, right? it was Come just on, like, man. we're just, it's all good. Like, yeah. this is, and, you know, and, you know, some people maybe would even use, like, it seems like revivals happen, but, like, sin got in the way yeah. and is in the way, and it's it's sad. So yeah. I was just on the phone with someone, another pastor up here. He's like, I'm just sad by where things are. I don't know who my friends are feel like the middle is just evaporating yeah and i don't know if that's a hundred thousand feet or ten thousand feet yeah that's what i say enough. but i say right now i feel like all that fighting has happened and now cats are like bro, the, i'm taking my ball I'm a, going a, a settling has taken place yeah 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 but not a certainly not a restoration of relationship and fellowship yeah uh, okay, so in light of people settling in their different positions, some less thoughtfully, more reaction airily, if that's a word, uh, some more thoughtful, mm-hmm. right? They took this time to do the work, to read, mm-hmm. to study, listen, pray, have hard conversations. And maybe they've even still arrived at, well, not maybe, we still have arrived at various conclusions about the race question in relation to the gospel, in relation to American life. Sure. Uh, where would you say you and I land differently, not necessarily on this idea or that idea, but maybe if we were just to do what we did on your podcast to yeah. take the sort of Kevin DeYoung yeah. one through four, right? Uh, uh, I I mean, in the Defend and Confirm podcast, we did like a 15-part series on critical theory, a mm-hmm. six-part series uh, critiquing critical race theory. Mm-hmm. Um, that has, in many people's minds, sort of put me in one camp. Mm-hmm. You have the United We Pray podcast. You've mm-hmm. spoken in certain ways that has, uh, in the minds of some, put you in a, in a different camp. Mm-hmm. Um, yet I'm inclined to think that you and I have more in common I think than true. we than we have, right? So, but w- what would you say if you were to say, okay, uh, Isaac and Sean, how far apart are we? Man, that's such a good question because it's such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like even people listened listened to our podcast we did for United We Pray, where we were trying to tease some of this out, and they one brother another brother pastor who both you and I know he just said you know it's funny how much agreement there is when you sit down and define mm-hmm. terms mm-hmm. so i do think there's i do i'm sure there are differences like even some oh we'll plan on teasing out yeah, uh, yeah. on some projects you, you, you know we're putting our heads together on yep. um i mean the, the to use that taxonomy you just laid out i'm sure you're probably Three and I'm two, yeah, maybe, or I'm two point five and you're three point five. I was gonna say like you're if if I feel like I'm closer to three than you are to four. Ah, okay. Well, you know, I guess so. I'm, which, I'm bringing us even closer. Well I, well, I think the reason why I said that is it just depends on who I'm talking to. Well, that's and you probably feel true. the same way, that's right? For sure. Like some people think I'm a I'm a nine. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> and some people think I'm a two. Uh, yeah. Some people think I'm a one, which blows my mind. You know, the TGC debate, I said Tim Keller isn't woke. And uh, yeah. still still, still dealing with the, the blowback from that to this day. I'm sorry, bro. And, oh, well, yeah, it's nothing. But um, this is coming from a guy who has very much tried to attack and eviscerate critical theory, yeah. right? Um, and its various manifestations. So in our context, if somebody who has made it sort of their mission to eviscerate critical theory is called the one then it's almost like, how can we even do this taxonomy? Yeah, then I'm like, you know, negative five <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that taxonomy. So, man, I mean, like, I think, like, I just want to, what I would want to highlight is we do have the most important things in common. Right. That's true of every Christian. So, and, and we could go through that and rejoice yeah. in that. And yeah. that's obviously true. I think we probably share a lot in common. Maybe, I mean, maybe some of it is... um how we respond, I don't want to say missiologically, but how we respond to those things in the past or the primacy yeah. Yeah. of a perspective on the past and how that would affect how we would address uh, certain uh, certain conversations, realities today. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, I, I don't know what statements. That I was thinking about one that I was like, man, I felt like I could have teased it better on the United We Pray podcast. It was just like, when I hear this statement, just preach the gospel, mm-hmm. I think it's problematic on a level okay not because i don't love the gospel so don't right. anyone yeah. wanting, wanting to take a sound bite there yeah, it is there it is yeah i love the gospel i preached it last night and preached it last sunday i'm preaching it next sunday i can't wait yeah it's um, your it's your life's work it is and yeah. it's just like man i mean 
it, it is so good. I mean, the gospel, to, okay, I said we wouldn't rejoice in these things, but let's go ahead and rejoice. Let's do it. It is just this pool that is endlessly deep. And the wonder of it is the further you dive, the more you breathe. Mm. I mean, it's just so, I just feel like I'm, I'm, and as a pastor, and really like, you know, as a pastor who's like, okay, I'm the lead guy now. I'm just seeing what it does to a person and a group of yep. people. I'm like, this is otherworldly. This is mm-hmm. powerful. This is supernatural. So love the gospel. But what all I would say, so I think, but I think you would see that statement maybe. I think, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Sure. Like, yes and amen. Yes and amen. And like the nuance I would add to it is like, well, I think Jesus commanded us to teach them to obey all that he commanded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not to just simply proclaim this message of good news. Right. And say, but the good news has implications. The good news for how you has, live in the kingdom has implications. Yeah. So much so that James was like, if you don't rock with those implications, right. it calls into the very question the good them, news yeah. that you say yeah. you believe. Your right. faith is dead. Faith without works is dead. And yeah. so I think you probably agree with that nuance. Maybe 100%. You know, okay. Yeah. So then, but like, I think people would see us and see, well, Isaac says the gospel's not enough, and Sean does, and Isaac. Would you know maybe chew out some chew out chew up meat spit out bones on some CRT stuff even though I don't really want to talk about CRT I just <laughs> I just think Paul's so right when he's talking about question yeah well, Paul's <laughs> just so right when he's talking about contra- like yeah you yeah, know yeah. it only stirs up quarrels yeah. so anyway but that's to answer that question on some of our I, but I would generally say Sean and even maybe some of the circles you're associated with like P, you lean more conservative. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't know that I would use the word liberal, but I lean the other way. So I don't know what you say. Yeah. So I don't know what to call that. I don't, progressive and liberal sounds too political. Yeah. A label. And when I think of you, I, I don't think liberal. I think most of our dis- disagreements deal in the arena of like extent, perhaps Probably. definition. Yeah. So systemic racism, I think that's a real thing. Yeah. Um, the extent to which it's present in America today, I think you and I would probably disagree on it. Yeah. Yeah. How you define racism, I yeah. think is something that we might disagree on. Right. Uh, although we would both wholeheartedly affirm that any kind of ethnic partiality is a sin that mm-hmm. will, we will be punished for in hell if we mm-hmm. don't repent of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that... Uh, means of common grace, how much we can pull from things like CRT. Yeah. There'd be some disagreement there. Probably. Um, But even in that uh, little sort of theological triage, we see that the most important things we have in common. We do. And I think, you know, you and I have had these conversations. And I think one thing, you know, Sean, that I appreciate about our friendship is that we have a friendship outside of these things. Yeah. So it's just not all we talk about. Like we're pastors. We're often, I think only on podcasts about <laughs> race have we really have talked we really about talked race. about it. Yeah. That's why we're like feeling our way around. Like, but yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. But I do think both you and I are versed in that kind of that kind of triage and what you just did in like a minute to commend you. People don't do. Correct. So the conversation stops at when I just said, yeah, I think preaching the gospel or, you know, just preach the gospel uh, is a problematic statement. The conversation stops right Right. there. And now I need the wisdom to know who I'm talking to to say like, well, I'm not going to throw this firebomb out there. They're not going to understand what I mean. I have a responsibility as a communicator to, but... But I think what you've just done is like we've we've discovered the common ground and been like here it is and here are these nuances on the side and um, that are super important because they actually allow us to see each other and work together yeah. and love each other, I think. Well, praise God, brother. I think we're already starting to hopefully role model by God's grace uh, talking about race well, which is so, the title man. of your book. Yes. And that's... That's kind of what I really want this entire episode to be. I I read your book from cover to cover. Uh, I thought the most helpful parts of your book where you are, uh, are the parts where you're shepherding people Mm. through like, hey, you you think and say this and here's a better way to think. And here's Mm. a, I I felt you shepherding these imaginary characters Mm. in your book. Mm. And and I thought, oh, that's exactly what I do with my people. You Mm. know, I've got this person in my church who said something that I think actually is slightly racist. And I'm Mm. trying to think, what's the best way I can help them Mm -hmm. like correct that? And then I have this person over here who says Mm. something crazy on the opposite end of the spectrum. And I'm trying 
trying to think, okay, how do I shepherd them? Not bludgeon them, yep. right? But shepherd them yep. into the truth, right? Yep. So I thought which that- is a Which right there, that is a different approach. Very different. Certainly than, let's just call it Twitter. Twitter is, <laughs> yeah. Twitter is Rome in this sense. It is a brutal world. Yeah. And it is, you are out of step, you will be destroyed. You will you be. You will be obliterated, eviscerated, crucified, destroyed. Mm-hmm. And that approach, I hope, by God's grace, sorry to cut you off, but no, I, just want, I just want to draw out the things because yeah. these, are, these are the nuances. Like I'm like, if you don't catch it, yeah. you'll miss how you get to this kind of conversation. And I think this kind of heart and posture, which I think at the end of the day is, frankly, a less angsty place to be. I <laughs> could not agree more. an easier place to be. Yeah. Though a, maybe a more heartbroken place to be, but a softer place to be. Yeah. But I would just say what, what is represented there, I hope. And, and softer what, doesn't mean weak. No. Yeah, if any, right. I think if anything, it might mean stronger. I mean, that's a kind of kingdom of God paradox. Right. Like yeah. weak is strong, soft is soft is powerful. Yeah, right. But what I would say is what you just talked about, not bludgeoning your people, you know, I think people would hear that and be like, kick that person who just said that. You know, my some of my friends would say, kick that person who just said that, you know, somewhat racist thing out of your church. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, 2 Timothy 2, 24 is the controlling thing for okay. both you and I. That, you know, the Lord's servant must be kind to everyone. Even his enemies. Even his enemies. It's, yeah. just, it's not everyone who agrees with you, not everyone who, you know is on your side of the taxonomy, but to everyone. And it's that very kindness, you know, that might, God might. Use it to lead them to repentance. Use them to lead them to repentance, just like he did in his kindness toward us. That doesn't mean you tolerate. I mean, he gives us instruction for tolerating and not tolerating moral, clear moral failure and sin. Yeah. But it ain't conversation one, bludgeon, you're out. That's right. And I, I... There is a certain advantage that we have as pastors in thinking through these things because we are so used to dealing with a plethora of people, all of whom are at various places in their sanctification journey. And so it's just not hard for us to be like, oh, you believe something wrong. We're going to have to work on that. That's just normal. You know, yeah. I think you're godlier than me. I think it's a little harder for me. But, <laughs> Bro, you haven't uh, seen don't... me on my worst day. Okay. You it is, it is, I, I certainly have more categories than probably the average person does as yeah. a pastor. Yeah. Okay. But now back to the point that I was, I was getting at here. Yeah. I, I don't agree with everything in your book, Great. which this would be a miraculous book if I did. Right. I mean, I think I say in the first few pages, yeah, you don't have to agree to be godly. And, and so this is why I wanted us to talk about our differences because I want us in this podcast to do what this, this book is really all about. It's mm. how to have difficult conversations. Mm. It's not how to have conversations uh, in rooms with people that you, with whom you are in complete agreement, right? Mm. Echo chamber conversations are the easiest conversations in the world, right? Mm. But uh, even where there's minor disagreements, especially along such a, an explosive topic like race, um, the conversations can be really difficult. Mm-hmm. And so I just want us to have these conversations. I want us to spend the next hour and change role modeling what it looks like to have difficult conversations about mm-hmm. race. And I, I pray that God gives us the grace to do that. Amen. And we will need his grace to do it. Yeah. And on that, what you just said about the echo chamber, Jared Wilson, I think said something really helpful. Uh, he said, the easiest sins to preach against are the sins of the people who aren't in the room. So we're coming back to that. We're going to talk about Trevin Wax's idea of multi-directional leadership. All right. I think I want to hear your thoughts on that. But um, let's start off with a, a doozy. You've seen it. You've seen it. The the Mike Wall. Oh, and by the way, this is not going to be like gotcha journalism. I I'm not really hope try not. To, <laughs> no, no, no. This is a, a doozy in the sense that I think it'll just lead to a very fruitful discussion. Right. Okay. Um, and, and my intent in this is not even to be like an interlocutor. I'm not trying to debate you. I genu- genuinely want to hear your thoughts. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and just want to hear your thoughts. So um, you've probably seen the Mike Wallace, Morgan Freeman, uh, 60 Minutes interview clip. It's been posted everywhere, especially since 2011, as he's raised conversation. I'll, I'll read it for you in case you're, yeah. it's not registering with you. Uh, Mike Wallace asks Morgan Freeman about Black History Month. Morgan Freeman says, I don't like it. And mm. and he goes, you know, what month is your history month? And he goes, well, I don't have one. And he goes, well, why should I have one? And, and so on and so forth. The conversation goes until uh, 
Mike Wallace asks an easy question of Mr. Morgan Freeman. How are we going to get rid of racism? Mm -hmm. And uh, Freeman responds like this. Stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to stop calling you a white man. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. Mm -hmm. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You want mm -hmm. to say, well, I know this white guy named Mike Wallace. You know what I'm saying. And then they go on and they've, you know, Mike Wallace is descendant of Jewish ancestry and mm. so on and so forth. But uh, Morgan Freeman here is advocating for kind of the opposite of what you're advocating for. Mm. And, and brother, listen, we, I know that even when it comes to the subject of race, race there is no such thing as like a black monolith, yeah. right? Like yeah. different black people are going to have different opinions about how to handle this conversation. Yes, but I, as, a, as, as a guy who has black friends who are on both sides of the conversation, let's Morgan Freeman stop talking about it. Even atheist, secular philosopher, Sam Harris, right? The more you look at it, the worse it becomes. Let's treat skin color like the color of people's eyes. It yeah. just doesn't really register yeah. versus we need to talk about it. Yeah. Um, you are obviously, <laughs> you wrote a book about it in the <laughs> we need to talk about it yeah. category. What would you say to a, a Morgan Freeman if you were sitting here today and you were having that conversation with him? I'd say, number one, you have an incredible voice that <laughs> I'm jealous of. I want you as, to as a, as a preacher. narrate the story of my life. <laughs> Please do. Um, yeah, I mean, Morgan, is, um, I feel like I need to call him Mr. Freeman. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah, Morgan's all, 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 um, arguing for what would traditionally be called colorblindness. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, I, you know, I'll... I just, I love the nuance. Uh, so let me add yeah. a nuance. Okay. I don't think what I'm advocating is necessary. I certainly am advocating talking about it. Okay. To a degree, though okay. I certainly talk about like, hey, here are times to stop the conversation or when you should. Like, Okay. Um, but let me just say, I would say the opposite of colorblindness is a full-blown kind of what might be called an anti-racism. Mm -hmm. And I think there are aspects that... Which, can, sorry, just to find... Anti-racism doesn't just mean being against racism. Well, yeah, this would be... Thank you for asking for the yeah. definition. What I would say is a more... With more secular... Um, secular... Uh, like a hyper race awareness. Yeah, like yeah. a high, that. That's probably the simple. You, you say it here in your book, color consumed. Yes, you have okay. this helpful helpful chart on page sixty four. <laughs> yes, on the right, color blind, ostensibly yeah. ignoring race and ethnicity. Yeah, completely right. Yes, and then and I like how you have white, black, and gray <laughs> color coded. And then on the opposite side, there's color consumed, seeing everything through the lens of race and ethnicity. And in the middle, this is what you're advocating color consciousness, yeah. or to be color conscious, celebrating how all people are fearfully and wonderfully made and showing no partiality while compassionately honoring different experiences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I think one, one brother who I think is doing really good work on this is George Yancey, where he walks through the models mm -hmm. of colorblindness, anti-racism, um, and he, he critiques those models. Is that um, in Working Past Racial Gridlock? Uh, that's Beyond Racial gr yeah, Gridlock, which yeah. is what you're referring to. The book I'm talking about is Beyond Racial Division. Okay. So that's, okay. that's what I would say on that. But the reason I say that is because not I understand what Morgan Freeman is getting at um, in not looking at it. And what I would say to, or not, I, I forget. I almost want you to reread the quote, but um, I won't make us take the time to do that. No, that's fine. He says, yeah. you know, stop talking about it. I'm yeah. going to stop calling you a white man, and I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. Yeah. I'll yeah. just sort of know you as, I, th I think it's the echo of the 1960s, yep. uh, you know, like the the protesters, the, the black protesters holding up signs that say, am I not a man, yeah. right? And yeah. the point there for them was, don't see me, first of all, as a black man. See yeah. me as a man. Of, yeah. Yeah. And on so much of that, I understand because they were saying, I am human. They were mm -hmm. fighting for that. So, and you know what Morgan is getting at with saying, I am more than a black, uh, I am more than my blackness. Let's mm -hmm. call it. Yes and amen. Like we, we are, we, and that's why I have characters in this book because I realized pretty quickly, just to write a didactic, well, white people think this and black people think, it wouldn't work. You needed no. the kind of People flesh. are way more complicated. Yes, like people are complicated. They say true things and unhelpful things. They say, yeah. and so, um, and so that's, so on that, I'm like, yes and amen. And on one level, you know, 
Well, here's here's the critique I would offer Morgan. I'd say, Morgan, I appreciate what you're getting at. Appreciate, you know, all the things you're saying. Um, and we can talk about race being a social construct and all those things mm-hmm. and it not really existing. Um, we can, do, but like, we could talk about it being a a biological fiction, but a social fact, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what I'd really say is like, is not the way you look a part of God's design for you, and is not the way I look part of God's design for me, and In other words, is this kind of diversity simply a mistake, like God spilled the paint in heaven, or is it something that can be recognized and appreciated? And I feel like the colorblind approach uh, looks at the looks at the matter and is just like just ignore it, Mm. just ignore it. It it causes problems when we go there, and maybe the best kind of perspective they'd say it it produces quarreling. When we go there, it produces mm-hmm. strife. It produces injustice. And certainly it does. You have to, and they're saying, when you're consumed with it, as you have to be to say whites only, they they were so hyper-conscious, it just went the other way where right. it was terrible, it was horrible. And yet, is there a way? So, But I think there's, I think folks are often trying to throw out all the bad bath water, but they wind out throwing the Why baby throw, yeah, of that's right. goodness in the, in the conversation that we can have. That's one thing I'd say. One thing, I'd, if Mr. Freeman were a Bible man, um, you know, he would be quick, I think, to co- quote Colossians 3.11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, uh, free, but Christ is all and in all. What a beautiful verse, mm. right? Um, and colorblind advocates will say, see, mm-hmm. see, it's Bible. Mm. And I'm like, man, yes and amen, but two things real quick. Number one, you know, uh, and I think it's the verse in Galatians where he says, you know, there's neither male or female. We agree that there is. No one's gender blind. And we run the church as if that's true. Women's small groups, men's small groups. No issues. Men pastors. Yeah, men pastors. Right. There's there's real realities. We we run the church as if that's true. And even on that, Sean, I'm not even saying gender and race are the same thing, but I'm just saying— Wait, he said there was no, he said there was no j- gender in Galatians, yeah. and yet we recognize that's a reality. And in the book of Ephesians, we know that there were still slaves within the church. Yeah. And so Paul, just to come back to Colossians, so Paul, the very Paul who wrote that in one chapter, he comes back and he says in Colossians um, 4.11, he's going through kind of his co-laborers. This one doesn't get as much play. Okay. He says, in Jesus, who is called justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Mm. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Paul is saying, like, look, we got this team. It's diverse. These are the only Jews I'm rocking with in this, in this iteration of his ministry. Yeah. And they've been a comfort to me. It feels good, it feels good to be around some Jews. I mean, it's just it's, Paul was the Jew of Jews. He, like there was a reality. They yeah. understood what, what the 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 derision and the difficulty of Paul's ministry mm-hmm. to be ministering to Gentiles as a Jew. Mm-hmm. And there was specific ways they could encourage Paul in that. So when I hear Mr. Freeman just be like, "Well, obliterate it all." A white person can encourage you just the same as a black person, just the same as an Asian person. I'm like, I just think you're 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 overcorrecting in that sense, okay. and you're robbing yourself and others of appreciating the goodness of the similarities. And there are real similarities and real differences. Mm, that's good, brother. So go, let's go back to that history question. We're, we are <laughs> certainly not going to try to suss out all of the ways in which the present is affected by the past. Honestly, I think that's a sort of hubris Yeah. Uh, when anyone thinks that they can do that even, you know, more than moderately well. Sure. It, it's just a big, complicated, tangled sure. mess. Uh, there's no such thing as a monocausal explanation. That's correct. And there's rarely a, a di- or tricausal, uh, you know, explanation as well. Um, so I, I guess one question that that might be useful to ask here is, uh, at what point do we feel like we've escaped the sort of gravitational pull of the horrors of of history, right? Like, are we still going to be having this same conversation 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now? 
how many times are these organizations uh, and inter- interpret this question in the most charitable yeah. light possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, organizations like the SBC has issued multiple apologies for mm-hmm. things done in the past. Like, is there a point that you think we're going to get to the place where we can at least change the dynamic of of the way we talk and think and relate about race because history is so far in the rear view and we've sort of escaped the ripples of that? I feel like I just give the pastoral answer on this so much, or at least what I mean by that is the nuanced yes and no. It depends. Yeah. Uh, well, that's so, it folks. That's it. Thanks for coming yeah. to the room for nuance. Let me, let me explain. Um, no, in the sense of if we think <coughs> we can one day escape this conversation permanently, I think that's a naive perspective. And why I say that and is why I think it's useful to have the kind of theological definition you offered for racism in ethnic, partia- in ethnic partiality yeah. and it being ethnic partiality that yeah. can be expressed in a whole lot of ways. And I'm right. sure we disagree on some of those expressions, but let's just say that. Is because sin doesn't have an expiration date. So I mean, they can they can be more prevalent sure. in a society or not, and I think that's what we see in the history of America. Is it it was more prevalent, more explicit? Mm-hmm. Did it die? No, and I think you would say the same. Racism thing. Like, doesn't it, die. It doesn't yeah. die. That's all. I'm I lived right. in the jungles of Peru. I saw yeah. racism down there. Right. You didn't racism need to, yeah. doesn't die, no. and so and I think I think, but I think you know, folks with Mr. Freeman's perspective speak about it as if it can die. Well, what about not racism, but specifically like the the things that happened, I'm speaking for the American evangelical church, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Chattel slavery, Jim Crow. Uh, like, is there a point where you feel like in American Christianity, should the Lord tarry, sure. where the way, the way we have the race conversation won't factor those things in anymore? Yeah, this, I think this is a really useful question because I think this would probably highlight a difference. It's okay. like, a difference in, I don't know whether to call it approach or philosophy of ministry is too big a term, yeah. but uh, interpretation or let's just call it approach is I'm not sure it should. Okay. In other words, like I appreciate the question and I, I certainly am not, you know, in, in all this, Sean, it's not, I, I certainly don't think the conversation should be had ever for the purposes of white guilt, condemnation. If the Lord wants to work godly sorrow in whoever, please, Lord, sure, work. Right, yeah. But <clears throat> So I'm not saying let's keep having the conversation for that because I yeah. want folks to be re-incriminated and yeah. I really like being on the victim side of yeah. things. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like, you know, Sean, churches that we would agree were racist. Like uh-huh. you and I, anyone would be, yeah. that was a racist church. Yeah, sure. That was such a blemish what I would argue for so long in this country that to I, what I, what I fear about escaping it kind of hitting the escape velocity where, and I think what you're asking is like, will we get to a point where that doesn't control the conversation? Yeah, yeah. I think so. And I think there can be some health in that, but I fear that escaping means we don't look back at that and we don't learn sure. from that. We yeah. don't see that, that how that, how that could have been us could yeah. be us yeah. And how, hey, that's made this conversation hard today. And because, and this is, you know, where I think it's, we might disagree or a lot of people disagree is about the extent of these things. Like, are we talking about, you know, when, you know, America's founded? Are we talking about as soon as, you know, settlers are landing on this continent? But I'm saying if that was such a large portion of America's history. Yeah. Like, and that, maybe that's a question for you is like, how long would you say that kind of explicit racism was dominating mm-hmm. the American evangelical church in America? Because I, and I think this is like, what would you say on that? Because if it, let's just say, if it were a couple, I, what I feel like, Sean, is people would say, well, this thing that's affected us for a few centuries we should be able to escape it within a few decades. Mm-hmm. And I just don't get that math. Sure. I understand that, that it, with the forgiveness of our sins, it's done. Yeah. But like, I'm saying like, man, you have whole communities, all black communities, all white communities that are seeing things completely differently. Mm-hmm. 
And though the fact that these communities are separate are some kind of bitter fruit of the past. I don't know who, yeah. not saying it's monocausal. But I guess what I'm saying is, Sean, it'll take a long time. Yeah. And I think that's reasonable given how pervasive that the ideologies undergirding that kind of explicit, yeah. explicitly racist society, those kind of ideologies, how, how, per, um, how pervasive they were, how in some sense, you know, I call race the Velcro issue. It just touched everything. Mm-hmm. How we set up where we live, how we set up where we church, how we set up where, what kids, what education, our pools, finance, our education. so, yeah, on. so yeah. because it touched so many of those things, it's like, well, now, you know, just stop seeing it that way. And it just, it's like telling your sure. people on Sunday, I feel like, just stop sinning. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> your life will be easier. Heaven will, Jesus will be sweet. Just stop sinning. And yeah. it's like, I just don't think it works that way. Yeah. So if we were to move it out of the American context, sure. uh, Japanese, Shintoism, uh, a, an ideology of religion, really, of racial superiority led to Pearl Harbor and World War II. Uh, American-Japanese relations. I know they're not 100% equivalent. Sure. Hundreds of years yeah. of it in our land, on yeah. our soil, in our people. I'm just, I'm just trying to, to do a little yeah. bit of uh, compare and contrast here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Nazi Germany. Yeah. When I was in language school as a missionary, we had some Germans come through, and I would crack some Nazi jokes, you know? <laughs> Hey, listen, <laughs> listen, I think <laughs> we'll well, well, we were talking about like uh, uh, <laughs> the ability to joke about stuff, the ability to joke yeah. about stuff. Uh, I don't know that on a podcast you want to be saying no, I was no. cracking Nazi jokes, I, but I was. So okay. they were German yeah. and I was like, I would make some fewer jokes here and there, yeah. but like they didn't think it was funny. Right. Right. Um, nevertheless, I've talked to other Germans who say by and large that, uh, that the country seems to have moved on from that. Now, that was maybe a bit more concentrated, but not as lengthy. So I guess, and then you can just take really any empire in history, the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid Empire, the Assyrian Empire, m- m- most of which was wrought uh, with uh, racial strife. We know that many of those conversations have sort of moved past that. So I, I guess I'm just externally processing here, but I, I guess I'm just wondering... If, if it seems like it can happen elsewhere, can it happen here? Not to the neglect of our history, not forgetting what happened. Because if you don't learn the lessons of history, you're doomed to repeat it, right? But I, I like the way you phrased it, brother. Like, just not letting it be the main controlling force and factor. What's interesting is that there are a lot of evangelicals right now who are for the first time studying the history of racism in America and their mind is being blown. They had Mm. no idea how bad it was. They were like, First Baptist Church said what? (laughs) You know, and they did this. And 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 that's why there's two First Baptists in this city? Yeah, exactly. Uh, And so that's another thing that's so difficult about this conversation is that Uh, even as it feels like the tides of history should in some sense be settling, there are a lot of people who just didn't even know about the first big wave of history when it comes to racism. So I I guess all that to say, I would expect that at some point it should, the horrific history of racism in America in general and American evangelical Christianity in particular should come to bear less on these conversations. Yeah, I think that's sort of a forgetting what's behind, pressing on to what's ahead kind of a thing. Yeah. And I mean, uh I I mean, and this is where, again, because this is room for nuance, I would I would just not use the word forgetting. I would say not being controlled by sure. Right. Okay. Uh, but what I would also add is I think that I, I I don't know what to call it, but like there's a there's a perspective and a focus that we're already employing in this conversation that I think is useful just to highlight. Okay. And like what I would say is like, why do we feel, and well, let me pause right there and just address something real quick of like, as the as a pastor, and you're a pastor, and like, man, I want to, I, I want there to be room for jokes. Jokes are healthy yeah. and important. Um, and you know, this is why, you see this, even this conversation in just the comedian landscape with Dave Chappelle or right. whoever. And yeah. I, I saw... Um, was it Cedric the Entertainer? He was just saying, man, we got to protect Dave. Like, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. because art, like, he can't, art, he can't make the jokes. And, yeah. like, it's funny for a reason because we yeah. don't know it's going to, but it's just like, it was interesting to me. You said, like, you know, some of those German students were not okay with mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, 
what that gets at is the very thing I'm talking about of like, I think it makes sense why they're not okay with it right. or at least not okay with it coming from you. Right. Yeah. And they can maybe make a joke that you can't. And because I think, we beat them in the war. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Well, dude, I'm, I'm sure they're not watching this and I'm sure they just turned <laughs> yeah. it off. And perhaps my exhortation would be, you know, don't make those jokes to them. Okay. Um, but, uh, uh, or maybe at all. Um, but let me go back to what I was saying is there's a, there's a focus on this conversation of like, I, just my, I feel like there's, there's a perspective that says, when can we move on? Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my dominating question. Sure. When can I move on? And I'm not saying you're saying that. Sure. I just want yeah, yeah, yeah. to be clear. Yeah. But that's, that's what we've been talking about. When can we, when can, the, so that we can have health, so that we can like not be dominated by those things. And yeah, I saw my, I think it was Mike Tomlin who said this. Uh, he's like, you know, there, there's a side of this conversation that's asking, when can we move on? And there's a side of this conversation is when can we actually start talking about it? Mm. And I'm probably closer to here. Mm. And what I mean by that is my controlling question is not when when can we be done? When can we yeah. not? Yeah, you when, know that's not my controlling yeah, yeah, question. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, but right. when, at which point, at what point can we escape that? Yeah. I think what's what's so interesting about this conversation is that we really are having pockets of conversations because yes. I think when I'm talking to some people, I do want to say that. I want to say, yeah. when can you move on? Yeah. Right. Yeah. When I'm talking with other people, I'm like, oh, hey, I have a book for you to read. <laughs> Cause like the way yeah, you here think it is. No, yeah. just, like it's it, like, it blows my mind how ignorant you are of the history right. of race and racism in America. Right. So right. it's even difficult because I think what Mike Tomlin said there is valid again, depending on who you're talking to, the room you're in. Well, and that's where Paul, you know, I'm flipping into it, but that's where Paul would talk about different sinners need different responses. Mm -hmm. He's like to the to the idle admonish them, right. to the weak be. Yeah. But he said First he, Thessalonians. Yeah. yeah, First Thessalonians, I think it's five. And, um, but it is interesting. He says, be patient with them all. Right. Right. Mm. That's the key. That's the key ingredient. And that's yeah. what he keeps saying to Timothy. Be patient. Be patient. Yeah. Be pa and our culture hates that. Right. Oh, and that's especially where, about race. We can't be patient. Right. We can't be. So I want to be. So that's where. And but I think there's an even impatience. There's an impatience in this side of the conversation of when can we escape? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, but can we be patient with the conversation? Mm. And if we need to have it for a few decades, at least in my math, man, like I'm like, man, I'm sorry, but I think that's warranted given sure some of the, so, and I'm not saying, but like what I would say is I think there would be a lot of people who would hear maybe the last, whatever, 20 minutes on that question and say, these guys aren't even talking about the real thing, which okay. is, can we talk about can we talk about what happened? Can we talk about any way in which um, the present is affected by that, or just that? That can we even just talk about the desire to escape the conversation when I'm sitting in the pain of it, my family's sitting in the pain of it, and I need the Lord to speak to this problem. Mm -hmm. Not to tell me, well, just don't worry about, you know, and again, you're not saying this, but to use Mr. Freeman's language, well, just stop seeing me that way and stop seeing, and, and brother, there's lots of black people like Freeman who are like, mm -hmm. stop talking about it. Stop mm -hmm. teaching your kids that. Yeah. So stop teaching them that they're victims. Stop teaching them mm -hmm. that they're, and I think there's truth in that and it mm -hmm. can be truth in that. But I also think there's a reality of German, of your German friends who are like, Bro, that's that's not funny to me, and it's yeah. not funny for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, Multi-directional leadership. Okay, okay. I've not read the book. Sure, it, it's it's a tiny little book. Uh, I would recommend any of our re readers to to check it out, especially if you're in the church. And again, you probably you he just kind of puts a fine point on things that I think we sort of intuitively grasp as pastors, sure. which is 
On a Sunday morning, I know when I talk about uh, assurance, I have to say this thing to this group of people, Mm -hmm. and then I have to qualify it and say this thing so that Mm -hmm. these people don't mishear what I'm saying Mm -hmm. over here. So let me just use the life of a pastor. uh, Yes, uh, and nobody's ever happy with the balance you strike, (laughs) you know. But we just hope we. That's why we minister before the face of the Lord. Um, But let me just use my church for example, okay? My concern for my church is not that we are going to become woke, right? Just to use the common nomenclature right now, to become woke, right? My concern for our church is that we are going to veer into second level separationist fundamentalism, Mm -hmm. right? Where, uh, so an easy example, I had you- And then right there, you're trying to protect against, rightfully, an overcorrection. Yeah, an an overcorrection, absolutely right. Um, you know, I had you come and preach at our church. Some people in our church heard some of the things and saw some of the things that you've said about race online. They disagreed. And therefore they felt like because I was willing to Mm. partner with you, they had to break their partnership with me. Mm. Okay. In in our church, they left our church. Classic second level uh, separationist fundamentalism. Which Um, did surprise me, man. Like, I I mean, like, I'm like, and hey, listen, it's not because there's a black guy in the church. That's, yeah, that's right, you know, right. I don't think that's the issue. Right. Oh, I know it's not. But it, it, brother, you would be surprised how strong, maybe you wouldn't be, <laughs> how strong no, this tendency is. I think I would only because yeah. I don't pay a lot of attention to that. Yeah. But yeah, yes. Well, yeah. and it can also go the opposite direction. I'm sure you've encountered this where maybe some of your uh, black or brown brothers and sisters who are like very heavily and emotionally fiercely invested in this race conversation have wanted you to separate from yes, certain people that they view sure. to be part of the problem. And because sure. you don't, they're for like, sure. uh, well, I have to separate from you. Yeah. Isaac is compromised. Isaac is compromised. And it just goes, he's colonized, baby. Colonized. There you go. Colonized, you know? compromised, uncle Tom, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, that right there is the perfect example of like multidirectional leadership. So in my church, right? Knowing our church's weaknesses, strengths, propensities, so on and so forth, our, our inclinations. I always try to address the the issue that could be most damaging, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say that is in your context of, of when you're having race conversations with people who agree with you, right? In, in right. my circle, in my crowd, Isaac Adams's crowd, what's my multidirectional? I know we agree, but I got to make sure that this doesn't get out of control. Yeah, that's a great question, bro. I really appreciate that. Um, and you know, more and more, Sean, my circle is my church circle. And what I mean Amen. is like, man, Praise I'm God, the brother. pastor of Iron City Church. I'm yeah. not the pastor of Sixth Ave. I'm not the pastor of Capitol Hill. I'm not the pastor of Third Pres. I'm the pastor of Iron City Church. These are my people. This is my family. And I'm called to shepherd these, you know, 271 sinners. And so, um, and so Birmingham's a really interesting city. It's a blue city and a red state, yeah. right? And it's, I've kind of been in those kind of spaces before, like Chapel Hill, blue city and a red, and well, North Carolina kind of goes back and forth. But, um, so it's a very liberal city and I mean that politically. And, um, my church is going to be predominantly, uh, leaning that way at sure. least. Yeah. They're going to share those sympathies, my church is skews really young. Like we are excited when the people over the age of 40. Are yeah. There. Like we're like young college students young in college, a liberal so, city. Yeah, yeah. UAB, medical town, very studied, you yeah. know. And so for me, the direction I actually have to guard, I am not worried about a single person being racist in my church. Right, yeah. Not that we pray as a ministry of the church. Right, so it's yeah. just like, if you're here and you don't get kind of what we're doing, it's like, it just calls into question maybe deeper things about yeah, like your awareness. Yeah, like just your intellect generally. Yeah. But my concern, so, I, you know, I'm preaching through Mark and I'm talking about Jesus feasting with sinners, with okay. tax collectors. And the question is, who is who is the tax collector? Because I think it would have been easy for me to talk about, well, the tax collector, you know, we need to look out for, you know, be it the prostitute or be it um, whoever. And someone pointed out to me, he was like, you know, I think for our church, the tax collector is the red MAGA hat wearing person who's actually a Christian, who's, mm. who's been saved by God. Jesus died for, Jesus loves, Jesus is actually crazy about him. But he wears that hat and he is sympathetic mm-hmm. with that agenda. 
and that candidate. So the people and in your church would look at him with disdain. Disdain. Yeah. They would be tempted to. Yeah. They'd right. Be not, not universally. Right, right, yeah. Right, they'd right. be tempted. And so I have to <coughs> preach that, to preach that. <laughs> that is like, it is wrong to hate that person. Mm. And it is wrong to assume that you're a better Christian than that person. Mm. And I, I, man, I should, I, it'd probably be worth us pausing and me pulling up what I said. Y'all, y'all remember what happened a couple years ago on January 6th in Washington, D, Washington, D.C.? That pathetic attempt to take over the nation's capital and how that coup was tied up with the idea of bringing about a Christian nation through force and political revolution? Just to be clear, when that revolution was happening, I was at the church I worked at before I came to Iron City, which was five blocks from the nation's capital. The memory is fresh in my mind. Friends, if you're here and you're not a Christian, Jesus wants you to know that what happened on January 6th is not the kingdom of God. No, it's quite the opposite. I assure you, heaven doesn't look like January 6th. Hell does. And if you're here thinking, yeah, that's right. Those red MAGA hat wearing fools are crazy. You tell them, pastor. Don't worry, Jesus has a word for you too. Friends, let's be clear. Justice is a good thing. We should seek justice as much as we can in this world. But for those those of us who are more socially justice minded should take care to remember that we can't fix this world completely. Only God can. Oh, we should take care to not love people who don't love Jesus, but happen to share our ideals of justice more than the people who love Jesus and the gospel, but who happen to disagree with us on some implications of justice. We should take care to not support or endorse ungodly ideologies whose agendas are trying to cannibalize the very just things we care about. Friends, if you act as if the way to bring about God's kingdom is to be just, but you forget to love mercy, you forget to walk humbly with God. Friend, you are just as bad as the red MAGA hat wearing Republican you may be so tempted to despise. I talked about the kingdom of God and you know, experiencing January 6th, being close to the Capitol. I was at Capitol Hill Baptist, and yeah. so Capitol's a few blocks away. And talking about how I don't think the kingdom of God looks like that. Right. It doesn't look like coercion. It doesn't look like force. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't look like trusting in a political entity mm-hmm. or putting Jesus' name on any of those kind of initiatives. Um, yeah, I think that, frankly, Sean, I think that's what... That looks like more like hell, not like the kingdom of heaven mm-hmm. in, in what I'll call it. And at that point, I know my church is, yes. Yeah, they're frothing Amen. at the mouth. Amen, bro. Amen. And I said, you know what? But those of us who would do that, who would, who would have that reaction, should take care that the very initiatives of justice we so deeply care about that we do not wind up endorsing ungodly ideologies who are trying to cannibalize the very just things we care about for their bigger agenda. And we should also take care that we do not hate anyone who is on the other side, especially if they're Christians, whom Jesus died for, even if they wear that red. And everyone's like, and if you are, if you are giving into those temptations, you are no better than the red MAGA hat wearing. You're just, you're mirroring. You're just mirroring. Yeah, That's That's all you're doing. It's just... You're just on the other side of it. One of the things that I've noticed in this conversation, as as I do think, uh, I, the, I think there are fault lines and people are lined up on on other other yeah. side, and we're gonna feel all really silly about this in 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 heaven. Oh, right? oh, I want to come back to that. Okay, but uh, what I've noticed is that a, a lot of people on on their on their side, they spend so much time focusing on people on the other side that they begin to act like them. It's it's just the biblical principle of you become what you behold, right? Oh, so true. And so the liberals who spend all the time focusing on on Trumpism and all that stuff and and the people on the right who spend all their time looking at the woke people, like as as someone who, you know, is more conservative and I think uh, again just to use a colloquial term wokeness, 
is is bad, dangerous, so on and so forth. I, it blows my mind when I see conservative people mm. acting just like woke people, just from a different vantage point, right? So, which I'm so thankful it blows your mind, and that's why you know you, on my podcast you shared about like yeah what the the things you would say in that direction yeah. to the people. It's just like, and it's I mean it's it's this weird you know. Robert George and Cornel West talk about this in a couple different articles, you know. Yeah, what a beautiful friendship. I by love the, way. the friendship. I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, you know, and so um, uh, I met Cornel West the other really? day. Really? I was in a restaurant and he comes in and I was like, that's Cornel West. And uh, yeah. Let's talk about that more over lunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> was, yeah. Um, but all I'll just say right there, man, is we become the very things we hate. Right. Like the, the yeah. very. We who started at Robert George and Cornell West say, we who started as the most sincere advocates of justice become unjust. Mm-hmm. And, the, and it's it's Israel becoming Egypt. That's right. You yeah. know, it's like y'all got slaved out of slavery and generations later, y'all were oppressing yeah. people. Book of Judges. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That is human nature. Yeah. That's good, brother. We could we could say more about that, but yeah. I just want to tell you that I'm thankful to know that you're willing to push in 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 all directions. Mm, bless you, bro. Um, you write, you write as a pastor and talking about race. Mm-hmm. Let, let me ask you two hypotheticals. Okay. What is one piece of advice you would give to a pastor who refuses to talk about race, and what would you? what advice would you give to a pastor who talks too much about race? Mm. Let me give general answers and then I'll nuance them. Okay. okay? The, to the pastor who refuses to talk about race, I'd ask a question. Do you understand yourself to be teaching your people to obey? We can call it the full counsel of God, but all that Christ has commanded. Yeah. And how does you're not talking about this allow you to still do, to still teach all that Christ has commanded Mm -hmm. while never addressing this area. That's what I'd say. Uh, To the pastor who talks about it too much, I'd say, has has this become the thing of first importance in your church Mm -hmm. that has displaced what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 are the things of first importance? Yeah. I delivered to you what was of first importance. And I'm sure they'd have different. So here's the new, here's the kind of, it depends on who I'm talking to. What is it? Right. To the guy who never talks about it. And he, <laughs> he might be like, so we used to have a, pa- we used to have the pastor who always talked about it. I'm the new pastor here. Okay. And I, I will not talk about it because it, it tore the church apart. Okay. And to that guy, I could say, yeah, I could see how um, not talking about it. Uh, for a, for a little while is probably actually pastorally wise. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow you, to speak. You don't and have the, to comment and the church on. Is, the church is real. Like you're not going to have a church if you preach another sermon on it. Yeah, right. And some people are like, well, that that's what has got to be. Yeah. That's justice. And I'm like, brother, come on. Like play the long game. Yeah, right. Like, you can you can probably preach that sermon you want to preach to him. You just might need to wait a few years. Yeah. But here's what you can do. Yeah. You could preach a sermon on the conscience. Yeah. Okay, so now we have a category for you don't even mention race, but now it's like, oh, there's a reality where I can see something some one way and a different blood-bought Christian can see it a different way and he could still be a Christian. Right. And now maybe that actually gets at the heart of what that church is clamoring over. Yeah. So I could see some wisdom in that. And to the pastor who's like, I'm talking about it all the time, you know, he's like, listen, I grew up in a racist family and in a racist church, and I saw some of the most horrific things. And this is just such a burden of mine. And I'm like, that I understand. Like, that's what I'm saying. And it's like, you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to yeah. pastor these pastors. Yeah. Like, yeah, I see it. why are you doing that? Yeah. And, but there are, I mean, I think there are probably just kind of standard garden variety. Dude, you're being a blockhead. You're scared. And you're scared of a different thing. Right, yeah. You're scared that God really won't take vengeance. You're scared that we're all going to become, you know, closet wearing or... um not closet. Uh, uh, I was saying like uh, that we're all closet racist. And we're all nobody tell hood wearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hood wearing. Uh, hood wearing. You know, like it's just like or like we're all you know supporting this white supremacist institution or society or whatever. And I'm like, brother, man, people do not change by force. Yeah, 
they don't change. They change by grace. Yeah. And so you can preach that law, but like, brother, that's just, there's a more excellent way. Anyway. Yeah. That's good, man. Long answer. Uh, no, it's They'll fine. Be shorter. Uh, we have so much to talk about. Um, what would you say? Mr. Freeman would say we should stop talking about it. <laughs> stop it. Uh, I can't I can't tell you how often every time a race thing happens, that thing pops up on a timeline, you know? Oh, it's it funny. I, got, I don't even need to go look it up. Oh, yeah. Uh, what would you say? You know what? Next time I should have had it like pulled up. I could have shown you the actual oh, clip. Oh, there we go. We're learning. What would you say to a, a Christian, okay. white or otherwise? Okay. And those are the only two categories. Uh, who says uh, regarding... Um, a particular racial tragedy, right? We won't call it a murder or a killing. Right. At the end of the day, uh, uh, someone's dead. People image, are hurting. Image bearers dead. People are We're hurting. We're arguing. It's a tragedy no matter what, okay? Uh, to, to someone who says, brother, Isaac, I love you, but what you perceive to be a racial tragedy, I believe to be something else that essentially has nothing to do with race. So... A guy gets shot by a cop. The cop is white. He's black, but he thinks it's just a standard use of force kind of a thing, right? Just trying to fill this in a little bit. Yeah. And I think these conversations are inflaming hostilities that should be put out. Now, we already kind of addressed that latter part. Yeah. So let, let's focus on, on the first part, right? Um, at, in your church, let's say tomorrow, may it not be, but let's say in Birmingham, yeah. black guy gets killed by a white cop. Yeah. And it is not at all clear what has happened, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's in some sense, it's clear someone's dead, right? But it's not at all clear if it's, if it's been an injustice or what. Nevertheless, in your church, there are going to be people who react from both sides, mm -hmm. right? The, the cop is innocent, you know, back the blue, right? And then you have other people in your church who are another, another dead black man. And of course, you know, you white guys aren't whatever, right? Yeah. In that moment, What's the first, what, what do you think? How am I going to shepherd my people through this? Um, I, I know you're not asking this in some sense, but because you were about to ask what's the first thing maybe I'm saying or doing, honestly, Sean, the first thing I want to do is pray. Right. And people will be like, of course, that's a Christian answer. What, do you, what, what are you really going to do? I'm right. like, no, I'm no, really, first thing. I'm really going to pray. So our church had an, an inaugural prayer service last night. Yeah. I was so encouraged. I was so nervous about it. Not mm. because I'm nervous to pray, but you yeah. know, I'm a new pastor. I'm trying to introduce something yeah. new. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. is this gonna suck? <laughs> like, is this gonna and uh it was so so I preached Second Corinthians one eleven, just this this little uh little uh yeah short sermon on it. And I said, you know, prayer. This is the first thing Paul asked for in this book. And he goes through all his hard stuff. And he says, you know, God delivered us. And we have set our hope on him that he will deliver us again. And it's like, man, this is incredible. Paul has this redemptive view of his suffering. God used that to make us rely on him. And the first thing he says next is, you also must help us by prayer. And I love that because yeah. was, he saw it as not a last resort, but the first resort, the most necessary resort the most powerful resort. So I'm and he does it constantly. He does, he, he's just like, guys, please pray for me. I need pray. it. He's, he needs to, you know, he's honest in Philippians. Like, yo, y'all, y'all revived your concern for me. I'm thankful. But like, <laughs> and you sent some stuff. And, that's and even, even there, he's like, hey, just so you know, I'm praying for you. That's right. right? I'm, just, in, I'm in chains. I can't yeah. be there with you, yeah. but you better believe it. I'm praying for so, you. But let's get to the meat of your question. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, so, hey, that, that's a good qualifier. And it's, it's, uh, one of uh, one of my staff pastors says praying is not the same thing as doing nothing, yeah, and amen. so uh, it's and it's it's probably the most important thing. The most, yeah, so. the most. But we've done the most important thing. That doesn't mean there aren't more things to yeah, do. Yeah, that's right. More things to think through. So, you know what's so interesting? But again, I think this gets about the perspective of. So, okay, white guy kills this black guy, uh, cop, black image bear, both made in the image of God, both need. Grace, mercy, yeah. Um, I think one perspective sees that as simply an isolated event. This mm -hmm. one thing happened between this one individual and this one individual. I think I am going to see that more as that this happened between these two individuals in this city, with, in this state, where that kind of, in, that kind of stuff was happening historically, 
it was racially motivated. And so I guess what I'm saying, Sean, is, and this gets to your kind of velocity question, okay. is like, because I am so, because I'm aware of that. Yeah. And I want to share a brief anecdote in light of this. But because I'm aware of that, I'm not saying that that guy harbored racial animus in his heart. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people do assume that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it was necessarily racially motivated. But therefore, if it's not, there's no, there, there is no, the only dynamics are the skin color. Yeah. Like if it were a white guy, it wouldn't be a racial thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I get that. But those are the dynamics. And histor like, it comes up. It, it's just something you have to deal with, Pastor. I can't just be like, well, just ignore all the racial dynamics. Even in, like, let's just take it out of a hypothetical and go to the Tyree Nichols situation, tragedy, where you had black cops. I think this was Memphis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And black. They beat him to death, basically. And so, yeah. like, I had to ask the question, is this still racially involved? And I think my answer was, or at least where I was landing was, well, I do think there's that's a legitimate question even there. How could it be? We could we could talk about sure, that yeah. on the side. But let me just give you this anecdote real quick. I think it's related. Maybe it's not. When I first got the call, uh, my mom, um, who passed away a year ago, uh, when I first got the call to burn, and my mom is super godly, when I first got the call to Birmingham <coughs> or learned about Iron City, I went to my mom. I said, Mom, I, I, I found a church. She was like, that's great. That's wonderful. And I said, yeah, um, it's in Birmingham. And my mom is super meek. Okay. Meek, 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 yeah. meek. Not, not a huge, not a large personality. And, bro, she recoiled in horror. She said, oh, Isaac. And she said, I told the Lord I would never step foot in that city after what they did to those four little girls. Mm -hmm. 16th Street. Yeah. Bombing. Yeah. Racially motivated, obviously. And so I bring that up, Sean, to say, and my mom was, when that happened, my mom was those girls' age. She was old enough to be one of those little mm -hmm. girls. And so I bring that up to say, one, it's not ancient history, but beyond that, if that hypothetical shooting you just described between white cop and, and black man happens, my mom is not just thinking about these two individuals. She's thinking about 16th Street. She's thinking about her son in this city, in the South. She's thinking, she's thinking about lots of things that this necessarily stirs up and evokes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's at least insensitive, if not something worse, to say, stop thinking about those other things. Okay. And I, I not even insensitive, just impractical. Like that's not, in my experience of being a human, that's not how humans work. It's, to me, it's like telling, telling someone who's been abused. Abuse is so sensitive. I almost fear to just right. Like yeah, someone, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like telling someone who like this terrible thing has happened to them, and something that would bring up that terrible thing in their mind happens between these two people over here that it had nothing to do with them. Yeah, yeah. And me being like, don't think about that. Yeah. Well, like you're the problem for thinking about that. Mm -hmm. If when I'm like. Actually, this is the problem. And I also don't appreciate necessarily in how people might approach that person and be like, stop seeing it that way, is because it at least implies that you're saying it. I think what that person is trying to say is we don't know it was that or mm -hmm. we don't know if it's related to these mm -hmm. other things. But what it can easily sound like is it's not related to these mm -hmm, other things, mm -hmm. which presumes that you know it's not related. Like you've got to prove that as well. Yeah. Like, how do you? So, yeah. I say all that to say, Sean. Like, um, that's what I would say is like to the person who's like, you're making it a race thing. Yeah, I was like, I did not make it a race thing. Yeah, it. Yeah, you live in a racially charged world. You live. Yeah. <laughs> people in the past made it a race thing. Mm -hmm. And we are their children, like it or not. Yeah. And so, I mean, just think of like two families who had a beef. The Hatfields and the McCoys. The Hatfields and the McCoys. And, you know, Tiny Tim Hatfield is playing with, you know, Tiny Terry Hatfield. Uh, and they get in a fight. And 
the bro- and it's just between these two boys. That's all that's happening. But the brother says, the Hatfields always do this. Uh-huh. Is he crazy for saying that or yeah. thinking that? Is he right? Kind of. Yeah. And so that's what we're ha- that's what we see on a much larger scale. And I think if we could have more conversation like this, like tell me why you see it that way. Okay, that is a good point. Yeah. I'm a little fearful though that you're just writing the narrative off simply in 280 characters. As it is necessarily only racially only racially motivated, only fruit of a racist society and it's like Man, violence and all these things. Like, man, we live in a society where UFC is promoted. Like, where we, we right. watch people yeah. beat each other for sport. Human cockfighting. Like, they, so yeah. you're exactly right. It's just like, it's not monocausal. There are so many things converging yeah. into what's happening. But I, I, the racial one gets so specifically charged. But that's because of the such specific way that has controlled so much of American interactions and societies. Yeah. Historically, okay. So, well, yeah. let me let me shift let me shift the angle on this a little bit. Y- you pastor me right now, okay? Okay, okay. Uh, by the way, I'm, here we go. I, as a sheep, I bite. Okay? <laughs> 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 no, but uh, you you shepherd me, okay? So I yeah. I had a conversation with a brother, um, young pastor, very young, okay, younger than both of us, yeah. okay. Lived in the north his whole life. Lived in how a, old are you? Thirty six. Thirty six. Yeah. Um. Lived a fairly sheltered lifestyle, uh, never really, you know, been exposed to much, right? But black brother. And uh, I invited him to come down to Alabama and legitimately, he says, um, I wouldn't even drive through that state, mm. right? Mm. My first reaction is, are you are you serious? Mm. Are you kidding me? Because he's not your mom, right? Yeah. Here, here's why I think this is maybe uh, a, another helpful, let's just turn it 10 more degrees or 20 more degrees this yeah. way, right? Like your mom's sentiment is much more reasonable, right? Yeah. Um, this guy hasn't, I mean, he's experienced probably some minor racism, maybe yeah. some major, major racism, but uh, it, it's just very, very different. And and he has in his mind built up this myth about what the South is today, when in reality, like the the tiki, the tiki torch march, march, right for white supremacy, that happened. I, I won't tell you the city, but it happened. Oh, I know, brother. Okay, I was I was married in the city. Okay, happened. so it happened. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I mean I won't tell you the guy. But oh yeah. It happened like ten miles away from you, whereas like uh, that 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 won't happen in no, Birmingham. That's no. not going to happen in Decatur or Huntsville, no. Alabama. So. Um, in this book, when people feel and think certain ways, you shepherd them. Shepherd me through my thought process. They're like, "Are you kidding me? Come on, man! You're, yeah, this is ridiculous." Yeah, I hear you. Um, and you you might not be wrong. I think what I would ask you some, but like, here's what I ask Sean: is like, how well do you know this guy? Mm-hmm. Because he might have my mom, who has spoken into his life with a legitimate fear, and he's kind of conjured it up, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. maybe to even be more honest in the car is like I wasn't that guy I wasn't like I won't go because here I am and yeah. I live here and like Birmingham you're exact Birmingham is 70% black like yeah. you just gotta understand like it's not like there are like tons of anyway but yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like but I think what he fears is like su- he's just thinking the whole state is a sundown town right, right, like right, if yeah. you're not out of here by sundown yeah and those are real. And those are real. Yeah. And well, like, not, not anymore, but they used to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd say, uh, yeah, I'd say arguably, but yes. It, yeah. to by the and degree, large. By and large, large yeah. to the degree we're talking about, not yeah. real. And so, but he's he's thinking that. And I think that's just where you, this happens all the time as a pastor. You could say, dude, you're ridiculous. You're an idiot. Get down Sure, there. I wouldn't want to say that. And you wouldn't yeah, say right, that. Yeah. But you, you just have to tease people about, like, why do you think that? So more information, like yeah. what I would encourage you to do is give him more information. Be like, bro, tell me why you think that. Sure. And man, like I would even say, Sean, you can say like, man, it grieves me that that, that has to even enter your mind. Mm. It gr- like okay. I'm, I, I'm grieved by that. I really, man, like I really think you'll be just fine for these very clear reasons and I think, man, I would probably leave, I would probably encourage you to leave it there. In other okay. words, I would say, don't even address, like, and bro, like, just to encourage you, like, I think you're writing off a whole part of the country that unfairly, 
like you could go that rebuke route, but is it worth it in that moment? Okay, well, let's forget about rebuke. Yeah. Is yeah. there a sense in which in that context, it might be useful for for me to say, and this is totally off the top, don't yeah. judge me too yeah, harshly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But like, hey, th- there's there there's um ignorance is too strong of a word and it would be too biting in that context, right? Yeah. But to just try to like inform him, like, hey, you have a vision of something that that is is not accurate and to try to give him a more accurate picture uh, in that moment. Because I think that's yeah. from the conservative side or the, the, the threes, right? right? They feel like any time this conversation comes up and I try to bring up like facts, right? Not weaponized facts. Yeah, like, but just let, facts. Yeah, just like, hey, you know, the, actually the amount of black people killed by unarmed black people killed by police officers and in, in yeah. the last has is you think it's thousands well guess what it's less than 20 right yeah. um to any time you do that it's completely it, it, like not only invalidated but seen as hostile yeah yeah right yeah, yeah. so is there a place to to bring up facts uh in a helpful non non combative way in these kinds of conversations Yes, but where that place, I fear that the threes think that place is a lot earlier than it really is. Okay. Kind of like Job's friends, right? Yeah, Just that's right. And unwise I, I, counselors. And that, the straight answer to your question is like, with, with this guy, I'd say yes, but not in that conversation. Okay. And you're, you, I, I understood you to be asking, isn't, is there a place for me in that uh-huh, first conversation right, yeah. to be like, and like, maybe if y'all are best friends and you'd be like, bro, you're my man, a hundred grand, you know that. Bro, you sound dumb like you're like like <laughs> yeah. you like yeah you like there you're there is an ignorance here and i want to address it for you because a rebuke goes deep into a heart of a man of understanding right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you should receive this but i i would still say sean is like you do need to take into fact it's like i'm a white guy saying this to a black guy like it like there's just and like what i've thought of was proverbs 16 21 it says the wise of heart is called discerning and sweetness of speech incre- increases persuasiveness. Mm. That I read that the other day. I don't, it's like, you know, those verses you're like, I don't feel like I've ever read this. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm like, that is not in talking about, I hope it, the spirit of that is in talking about race, but yeah. I was like, that should be chapter one. <laughs> and so, like, all I'm saying is, like, you do have to take into consideration, like, is this fact going to taste sweet to this person? Mm-hmm. It's okay if it doesn't. Yeah. But just know they won't swallow it as easily. Yeah. And so you can say that thing, but I wouldn't. Not in that. I would rather be like, bro, here's the, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fly you down here. You don't have to drive. I'm going to fly you down here. I'll, put you, I'll pick you up from the airport. You'll be with me the whole time. Let him just see. Okay, this is kind of what I was thinking. It's kind of ridiculous. Like, they're, they're, this is just not the KKK headquarters yeah. that I thought it was. Yeah. And, you know, and all of that is much more expensive and longer and blah, blah, blah. And maybe you never wanted him to <laughs> come down here in the first place. But uh, but love is expensive and slow and longer. Yeah. And so I would just be like, bro, like, come on. And then if he's still like, man, how do you live in this racist part of the country? I'd be like, number one, homie, Jesus is the captain. And if he wanted me to come down here, he sa- he calls mm-hmm. the shots. Jonah mm-hmm. has to go to Nineveh, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's the beauty of what we see in Jesus and Mark is Jesus goes to the side of the Sea of Galilee that's the Gentile side, the side of the Gerasenes, and it's his idea. He's like, Mm -hmm. let's go to the other side, Mm -hmm. Mark 4. I was just like, let's go to the other side. Mm -hmm. So simple. Jonah's like, let's get away. But anyway, but because there is a place for fact communication, but just do so with wise timing, right? Wise timing, and I would say sweetness. Yeah. And I do think, to, I think sweetness lacks on the threes and the fours. Yeah. And I, I it, it lacks on the ones and twos, let me be clear. But because the threes and the fours yeah. are n- more naturally our kind of friends. Yeah. You're there is something missing there. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is. I don't know how it is. But it gets exactly to what you were talking about with Luther and Calvin. Yeah. Like, I'm ashamed of it. Yeah. Because right. there's just, there's a brutality there that is just thinks force and truth is enough without love. And Paul's like, homie, if we don't got love, we don't got anything. And yeah. we're, we're not anything. Anyway. Amen, brother. Preach. Uh, what do we need to agree on mm. regarding 
matters of race in order to have unity with one another in the local church. Now you can take that any way you want as an elders. That's a great question. We have to agree. It's a sin. Racism is a sin. Yeah. Beyond that, You know, and I'm assuming, well, it's so funny, you and I, we share so many assumptions and even in this, like I'm assuming unity is already accomplished by right. Christ at the cross. Yes, it already right. exists. Yeah. But like, I know what you mean. Like to have, you know, what does someone have to agree on to become a member of Iron City Church? Or even, I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen in the last 10 years is an exodus yeah. of people of color from predominantly white churches. Yep. And we're not going to go into all that today. There right. is no time. <laughs> there is not. But it's largely because people have felt like um, we do not have sufficient agreement on these things yeah. in order to have unity in the local church. Yeah. Now, I, I, I appreciated your section in your book where you, where you said uh, essentially like, hey, you're free in Christ to like go find another church. Like, praise God, you live in the United States. If you can find another gospel preaching, Bible believing church in your city where you have, where your conscience isn't bound by these things, great, do that. But let, you know, let's pretend that yeah. we're in After Corinth. After asking these questions. Yeah, yeah. L- yeah. let's pretend that we're in, we're in Corinth, you know, yeah. or in Philippi. There's only one church. Paul ha- says like, hey guys, I need you to be of one mind, okay? You know <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying? Like, you got to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And the Spirit will help you, but you got you to gotta do this, right? Yeah. So um, what what is that base? Uh, and this, you don't want to just ask, what's the bare minimum? We yeah, want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. but like, what is the, the the base level agreement that we need to have in order to do life together and, and perhaps disagree on some of the finer points? And my first thought is, yes, exactly what you said. We have to agree that, that racism is a sin, right? Yeah. A sin, an excommunicable yeah. sin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I think beyond that, I think there, there probably, it, it's really tough because the answer will be different for different people. But I'm actually thinking through this afresh in my own life, not in my church, but in a different scenario um, of partnerships with folks. So it's a bit outside the church. Like I think in yeah. in a church, you have to, you certainly have to agree that's a sin. I think you have to be on, I think there's some practical things you have to kind of implicitly agree on that I'm not going to put in the statement of faith. Right. But in our membership class, here's a very practical. Okay. We, there's a little section of like, you need to know this before joining the church. So yeah. something we say a lot at Iron City is clarity is kindness. Yeah. It's kindness for everybody. Yeah. And so we say, hey, we talk about <coughs> um, matters of racial injustice here at this church. You should know that before joining. Now, we're not saying you have to agree with us on everything to be a member. Um, and you can even, you can disagree on some things, but if, if you're, if what's going to be a problem for you is not simply how I said something, but that I said anything, mm-hmm. this is going to be a, this is going to be a hard church for you. Right. Yeah. And you should think through that. Now I want to be really careful with that, Sean, because I don't want to create a cult of personality of Isaac Adams I want some people who disagree. I want Sean's in my church. Sure, yeah. I, I need Sean's in my church. I need that. I say that world. in our church as well. Okay, yeah. so. I need the twos. I need, you, I need the twos. And man, it's like even, even the one, like, I think the most, it's hard because ones and fours, it's like to be in those camps, by definition, you have to. And they're prone to fight. Right, right, yeah. right. And but, I don't really need that in the church. Right, right, <laughs> I really I don't. Feel, I feel that. So, but I guess what I'm saying is, that's not a really a doctrinal position, more of it's a how we live position. Yeah, do you agree? So, it's kind of like a church covenant thing almost, right? Like, right? like, like do you agree that it's okay to talk about? Well, yeah, will we bear and, with one another in the midst of disagreements? Like, will you love me through that? Will you, you respect my conscience? Right, exactly. Like, can those are those are the kind of, like, agreements we need to have on yeah. how we're going to do life together Yeah, if we're going to do life together. Yeah. And so I think that's my kind of baseline. It's probably less on like, I think you have to be able to say, you know, I, you know, Sean, like, do you have to agree that systemic racism ever existed to be a member of our church? Yeah. I don't think so. But would someone who has that idea hear what I just said about racial injustice and be like, yeah, I'm I'm still good. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. But, I think there's a, a level of reality. Like you even said it earlier of like, we understand this happened historically. Mm-hmm. 
And I think there is like if 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 someone says it never happened historically, and you're wrong for thinking it, you're just that's a four, yeah, and a one. That's like a seven, I don't know. What yeah, that's that a, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. like eight, like <laughs> yeah. twenty five. Like yeah. it's just like at that point you're not even into engaging with any kind yeah. of intellectual honesty or integrity. So there's nothing in the books that would prevent them from joining, but just practically, just practically, uh, one like, month of Sunday services, right. they'd be and like, ah, like, this and like, man, I don't think at ICC, like, you know, I use it in sermon illustrations and stuff. We talk about like, but yeah. I, I, I think people would come to ICC and be surprised how little they hear that from me. Yeah. I think, right? I think the uh, inverse is also true regarding us and mm-hmm. wokeness and stuff like that. I think people come here and expect us to be sort of like rampaging about things like that. Yeah. Brother, I'm just going to preach what's in the text this week. Hey, man. And like, if there's a valid application to make, I'm going to make it. Yeah. But, but it's going to be in the direction that probably actually steps on your toes because you pay me to step on your toes. That's right? exactly right. And so, yeah. Isaac, we are running out of time, and oh, I have a man. lot of rapid-fire questions Here we go. I want to ask you. Do your best to resist the urge to be a preacher, okay? <laughs> just try to give me the rapid-fire. Yeah, I uh, rapid fire answers. Uh, do you subscribe to CRT? I can't. I can't answer that if I don't know what you mean by. Okay, it. that is itself a good answer because yeah. very often people use those terms on the right and the left, and they yeah. have no idea so, what they're talking. Uh, we'd about. have to have a more nuanced conversation. Can't answer it. We need uh, more more room for more. Nuance. Room. I'm going to start a podcast that says rumor, <laughs> roomier, nuance. roomier for nuance. Yeah. Uh, what? Um, you wrote a book about um, about talking about race. Would you say that you are good at talking about race? Uh, by God's grace, better than average. Okay. Is the gospel the answer to racism? <laughs> what do you mean? Um, <laughs> uh, it, de- it depends on what you mean by racism. Okay. That's my answer. All right. Um, if we only had the Bible and nothing else, no sociology textbooks, no history books, no anything else, we just had uh, the reality of the sin of racism, ethnic partiality, and other stuff that goes along with it, uh, and, but we only had the Bible, would that be sufficient yes. to put racism to death? Yes. Yes. Amen. Um, just like, I mean, Paul. Paul's listeners didn't even have all of what we have. No, no. And he's at all. like, I'm writing to you. And anyway, I'm being a preacher. Sorry. Go no, ahead. it's all good. Uh, is Nine Marks woke? <laughs> Ask Jonathan Lehman. <laughs> I did. I did a podcast with him. <laughs> I said no, but it wasn't good enough. <laughs> he said no. I said no. It still wasn't think, good enough. I, no, I don't think so. Yeah. But like I said, man, I, I got my hands, heart, and mind full with Iron City and United. Amen, Plan, but brother. I love those brothers. And my answer would be a clear and profound no. Um, what should someone do if they're discouraged in their evangelism? Is this where I say buy my book? Yes. Step number one, buy the (laughs) the book. Yes. Realize that you're a normal Christian and there's hope for you. You say, uh, you say this book is for those who want to share the gospel message, but for whatever reason, struggle to do so faithfully. I would say that would be the vast majority of Christians. There are some people who have the gift of evangelism and even they struggle, right? Yeah. And I put you in that camp, bro. Oh, praise God. Thanks, brother. Perhaps you get awkward or silent when an opportunity to share the gospel emerges, or you feel like you don't live a good enough life to tell people about a good God. Maybe you don't want to lose a job or friendships, but following Christ means loving those who don't follow Jesus, and that love includes sharing the gospel. What are some reasons you may not be sharing the gospel? Do you expect the church staff to do it, or perhaps just the extroverts in the church? Are you too busy with your plans uh, to think about someone else's eternal state? Are you a Christian in name, but a universalist in practice? That was deep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Acting as if God will simply save everyone in the end anyways. Are you ashamed of God's justice and goodness and judging and condemning sinners? If any of these reasons describe you and your lack of evangelism, I'd like to gently say two things. First, you need to repent. Second, there's hope for you. If you're a discouraged evangelist or if you feel like one, this book is for you. The good news for bad evangelists is that the same gospel we want to preach to others is the same gospel that gives us the power to obey Christ's command to share the gospel 
with others. I, I read that whole section to my congregation mm. on a Sunday morning, mm. and I was like, this is everyone in this room. Mm. I have five copies in the back. Go get one, read it today, and pray and ask the Lord to help make you a better evangelist. So brother, I just wanted to commend you again Bless for you, how bro. useful this is. Have you have you heard any good feedback, response? Yeah, this yeah, man, that, that, oh God. Yeah, man, I think, um, and it's, refer- I mean, maybe to just, I know we're running out of time. No, it's like, okay. I hope even that picture, and there's another book I have on, you know, just spiritual disciplines. I hope in some sense that's kind of representative of my heart and ministry of like, I wrote this and that. Right, right. And this is not my life or my identity. I mean, like, right. I, so I, I, it's important. Right, it's important. But, it's but, not you, but Sean, you're an author. You Like, I don't know if you're like me. I look at my books, I'm like, Man, I wrote that. Like, I like. I don't <laughs> yeah. even. I don't even know if I had the energy to do that. Could again. I do it again? Like, could I do it yeah. again? Would I do it? So, yeah. But I say all that to say, man. Like, I'm relieved that there's a whole ministry that that book has. That you know, some people might leave your church when I come in the name of this. Yeah. Or even if they project yeah. this onto me unfairly. Yeah. Um. But man, like, praise God because that's what I want. I want the the thing of first importance to go out and the rest will agree yeah. about in heaven. And this is, I want to come back to what yeah, you said. Yeah, you, you did it, man. Good for you for remembering. <laughs> you know, Mark, so... Um, Mike we were, Devers? <laughs> Mike Devers, that's right. <laughs> we were talking about, it was not anything, I think it was the like historic disagreement between Baptist and Presbyterian mm-hmm. centuries old on, on baptism. Yeah. And, you know, Mark, he said something like, you know, you know in heaven we'll see who's right. And, you know, we're all like, yeah, and amen. But he said something that stuck with me. He said, if we even care then. Right. And I wrote a horror article about this because John Newton was so clear about the reality of heaven and how in heaven your worst enemy, who's a Christian, yeah, the one to the four, the four to the one, right. he will be dearer to you yes. than your best friend on earth right now. Who's not a Christian. Who's not a Christian yeah. or who even is a Christian. Like, yeah, right. They, they will be dear. Like in, that, in, in this sense, like if you were my best friend, even though you're a Christian, we're still in the flesh. We see dimly. All of, but I'm not trying to get into the logic of all of it. Yeah, all I'm right, just right, saying yeah. is like you will love that person right. in ways you never thought imagined. James White... And to be the yeah, like, when well, they're in heaven, it will be, it will be, it's going to be nothing. Thing. It'll yeah, be a beautiful thing. Nothing man. Between and so them. I just say all that to say, man, like that controls how I try to have the conversation of like, yeah, that's huge brother. This can't be every, it's not, it's not, this isn't all of me. It's not all of you. Mm-hmm. And in heaven, Christ will be all in all. And I read that somewhere. Yeah. It's just like, we won't, there will be so many things that I was right about and so many things I was wrong about. Yeah. And, but none of that, he will be there and see him face to face. This will be the one I've waited for. This will be the one my soul loves. This will be him. And no longer am I just encountering him in his word. I am encountering him physically. Mm-hmm. I am encountering him in every aspect of my being, emotionally, spiritually. And if no, like no one's going to come on over and be like, man, remember what you said on page six and talking about race? <laughs> like, how, what do you think you about it now? You're wrong about that, you know, like, bro, like, like, It will just be like the, reckon, the restoration. Like we can't imagine it. Yeah. To imagine it is to belittle it because right. we can't, yeah. it, the highest thought of it is too low. Yeah. And so, man, like, I'm just like, I care about the, and I want to seek as much temporal justice as I can because I'm a Christian. And yet, man, when the full thing happens, it won't just be justice that happens. It will be restoration, which is the goal of justice. Mm-hmm. That's right. Full restoration, that, that the relationship yeah. would be restored. Yeah. That's, that's what justice is there for. Yeah ultimately. And so that's going to be a beautiful day, man. Amen, brother. A couple more rapid fire questions. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. That's my no, last No, it's sermon. fine. Uh, brother. I I'm almost, not preaching this Sunday. So, you know, I'm, you got to get it out somehow. Yeah, there it is. Uh, no book is ever finished. Mm-hmm. You just got to turn it in. Hey, yes. Uh, any one thing you wish you would have added or looking back, you wish you could change. I think I would have given 
more. I don't know if you felt this in your well, it's rapid fire question. I would have given more to Anna Beth, I believe is her name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a little while since yeah. I read that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I would have given more and uh, to her, and she is the the woke character in okay. the book. And, interesting, which is interesting. But, yeah, yeah. Um, Probably shows more of who I was writing this toward, but yeah. Okay. Uh, some lighthearted affair. Hey. Uh, we made it through the waters. I, I think so, brother. Hey, Praise cheers. Uh, uh. Uh, favorite candy? Oh, right now I'm crushing some Cadbury eggs, but I, pr- yeah, yeah. I judge you for that. Cadbury eggs? <laughs> I judge you, They're bro. They're so good. I judge you so no, hard No, I mean, for my that. favorite sweet thing is, a, is an Oreo milkshake. Oh. oh, okay. All right. All right. I'm sorry. So I don't know. I like Oreos aren't candy. Are you talking like McDonald's? Because you no, can't no, ever no, get no, a milkshake no, 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 at McDonald's. No, 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 no Right. No, no, like home, home, like, like homemade. I mean, my vanilla ice cream and my Oreos and my milk. Yeah. I'm just... You're blowing my mind, Isaac Adams. <laughs> I would never make a milkshake at home. I'm thinking Five Guys is the only no, way. Bro, they ground the Oreos too fine. You got to have the chunks. Dang. Okay. Um, least favorite candy. Oh. Uh, and this says a lot about your character, man. This might cause more of a rift than uh, any any question regarding race. Oh, man. Uh, licorice. Uh, black or regular? And I did. <laughs> All black licorice. Black Lemons. licorice is terrible. But you, yeah. you don't like regular licorice? Red vines? No. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, you're not preaching this week? No. What, what book are you preaching right now? Mark. What's been the best thing about it? Oh, uh, learning more about the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, how can we pray for you? Um, I want more and more to believe the things that I just preached about longing for Jesus and and not just seeing him as seeing, I mean, that's what be that my vision is like seeing him for what he is and who he is. And I can theologize and make a lot of things abstract. Yeah. Um, and it's the uh, I believe but help my unbelief prayer. Yeah, like so make just it believe, realer. Be, yeah, make that realer. You can pray for my pastor in Iron City Church, man. I'm just, yeah. And you can pray, man, like pray I be a man of integrity leading that congregation. Amen, brother. Um, what are you reading right now? Uh, what am I reading right now? I mean, in one sense, I'm, I mean, there's stuff pastorally. I'm like working through Jonathan Lehman's understanding uh, the congregation's authority. Mm-hmm. Um, for fun, I'm not reading much, and I need to change that. Okay. But, yeah, I just I have not had much time to be reading. Do you do audiobooks? No, I just don't know that I can get into them. I hear you. Do you do podcasts? Not as much as you would think a podcaster does. What? <laughs> what's one podcast that's not your own that you would recommend, or that um, you or that you enjoy? You don't have to recommend it. Yeah, I'm trying to think. You, um, NPR's Horticulture Hour. No, I mean nothing immediate. I mean, I really don't spend much time listening to podcasts, but I'm yeah. trying to think. But I wanted to jump. I love Ray Orland, and I've wanted to listen to You're Not Crazy. Okay, so Ray Orland's the audio version of his uh, The Death of Porn. Mm, I read that. Re- I read that recently. So the book was amazing, yeah. but to have him read it. Mm. Every chapter, I was like, I'm never going to even be close. It's just like, <laughs> ah. I mean, I love, I mean, uh, that's, it's more, I mean, it's funny. When I talk about books I'm not reading, I'm like, that's just like, I, I get to the end of the year and I have a little stack of stuff I've read, but it's more people I'm listening to. Right, not, yeah. I don't really care if Ray's on this show or my show or whatever. I just want to hear what Ray is saying. Yeah. And I've been, and Ray was shaped by Francis Schaefer. So I've been reading some Francis Schaefer stuff. Gotcha. And, reading downstream. Yeah. yeah. Or upstream. Yeah. What's your favorite book, obviously, outside of scripture? Pilgrim's Progress. Ooh. Do you reread it often? Not as much as one who says it's their favorite book probably <laughs> right. should. Are you reading like the Little Pilgrim's Progress with your kids? Uh, we've read it. Uh, it got a little too scary, but they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> but it got a little, so right now we're doing Marty Machowski's Theology. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Our kids loved it. Yeah. So we're doing that. And then we're going to do uh, 
We've actually started Chronicles of Narnia. And then, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah so. Kevin DeYoung's The Biggest Story. I love all, so that, good. All, all that stuff. Is I, give that, I give that to the parents in our church. Yeah. Like I just give them a coffee because yeah. I'm just like, I want, I want you mm. to read this. Oh, well, and man, it's I, so edifying. I gave a copy away last night at our prayer meeting. And he also, now there's that like biggest Bible. That's the one I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, But okay. they're both good. They're both yeah. great. But the biggest Bible I've also given away. And a sister took it who was really struggling uh, and she even admitted that. And she was like, you know, honestly, I was struggling to get in the word and I figured I could at least read this. And she was like, this has been so helpful for yeah. me spiritually. Yeah. So bless the Lord. Last question. Do you have any hidden talents? Oh man. I'm a better drawer than. Like, yeah. Like I used to be drawing Dragon Ball Z characters all the time. <laughs> um, hidden talents. I mean, I think the talent would be poetry writing, not poet. Yeah, which is not so hidden. Yeah, that's not so hidden. Um, Other hidden talents. No, I mean, probably, probably, probably drawing. Yeah. All right. Be on the lookout for uh, a new (laughs) my picture book book coming out. Yes. Yeah. Well, brother, uh, this has been really useful. I, I, I pray, and we're gonna pray. I'll close this out with prayer now, but I just pray that uh, anyone who's watching this or listening to it will do so with a very charitable spirit, whether they're listening from a perspective that's more in agreement with you or more in agreement with me. Not even that we really parsed out many of our differences, but you can sort of intuit, you know? I think so. I think the the angle thing is very helpful. Like, why is that question your driving question or your framing question? And what burdens does that represent? And why are these my framing things? I think that's where... You know, Piper, he talks about the gospel like a jewel with many facets, Mm -hmm. right? And he says, when you're talking to some people, you hold the jewel up and you rotate it around so that you can see this facet. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking to different people, never compromising the gospel message, but just it's a question of emphasis. But it's also a question of perspective and vantage point. And um, that might even be a helpful illustration Mm -hmm. here, like holding up the race question it's just like it's rotated one way yeah. for you and another way for others. Yeah. You know? yeah, and I think we act as if our vantage point is the only mm-hmm. and is the best always. Yeah. So if you don't have this vantage point, dude up in New York who thinks you know Alabama is just a racist land and territory yeah. that you're too pure to enter into, yeah. you're therefore wrong. And it's yeah. like, well, he's got a vantage point too. One is probably more right than the other. But how can we get to agreement where you yeah. can actually see him? That's the goal, right? Yeah, it's right. like to spend time together. Yeah. So let's not break the relationship over this, that kind of dumb and ignorant comment. But how many times do we see that, Sean? Is like the whole horror. I, sorry, Sermon 3. Here we go. Ser- sermon 85. The whole horror of broken conversation about race is not really, I, I am sad for any kind of racial injustice that would be perpetuated and any wounds people might feel, it's, it's that people and communities fall apart. And whenever people and communities fall apart, there's injustice and sadness and brokenness to deal with. But that's why in the gospel what we see is not man just reconciled to God, but man reconciled to man. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, brother, let me pray. Thank you so much for being here. Mm. Lord Jesus, uh, we come before you humbled by the grace to be able to speak the truth to one another in love, Mm -hmm. not just uh, focusing on facts, but also uh, with a posture of humility, recognizing that you are the only one who has a perfect perspective of that which is true. Uh, Lord, we pray that you, by your spirit, would lead us into all truth, uh, more and more truth, even though we're never going to get it all uh, while we're here in the body in this body of death. Mm. Um, We pray that you will uh, clarify our vision through the study of your word and through more fruitful conversations just like this. Though we are imperfect, we do pray that other brothers and sisters in Christ would follow our example Mm. in in the way that we have uh, sought to have this uh, difficult conversation. Lord, we pray that you'll bless Isaac Adams in his ministry as a local church pastor. Help him to be all consumed in the best possible way with your glory being manifest uh, in that local church. Help him to raise up strong, faithful, uh, biblically robust, uh, devout men to lead that church. Mm -hmm. 
uh, raise up deacons, raise up members who love you and love the gospel more than they love their own lives. Mm. And Lord, we pray that you would do that in churches all across the globe. We, we know that you're doing that even now. And so uh, we rejoice in the grace that we already have in Christ Jesus. And we look forward to heaven, to the day when oh, none of Lord, this will yes. matter because we are just utterly lost in the glory that is shining before us. And we pray this in the mighty, gracious, humble, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, bro.